Welcome everybody to this webinar. My name is Marta González from Cytognos Marketing Team. Today I am very happy to present our invited speaker, Katarina Martins. She is going to talk about the role of flow cytometry in the lab approach of primary immunodeficiency. Katarina has a PhD in immunology and currently she is invited assistant professor of immunology at Nova Medical School. There, she is also technical manager of the primary immunodeficiency and immunology laboratory. This lab addresses both primary immunodeficiency diagnosis and also research projects. She supervises PhD and master's students and has co-oriented several laboratory traineeships for national and international medical doctors. At NMS, Katarina Martin is also the coordinator of the Biosafety Committee and a member of the Health and Safety Commission. In 2017, Katarina was elected vowel of the Iberian Cytometry Society, and she is also a recent member of the ISAC SRL Task Force. She collaborates with the Portuguese Accreditation Institute as technical and lead assessor for clinical labs, and she has started a similar collaboration with the Irish National Accreditation Body. Thank you very much, Katarina, and welcome. It is with great pleasure that I am here today presenting you this talk about flow cytometry in primary immunodeficiency. And I would like to start by thanking Cytognos for their kind invitation and also thank Marta for her uh, so gentle introduction. In brief, I will take you through primary immunodeficiency, starting with general concepts and then looking at how flow cytometry is relevant in the diagnostic of these patients, along with some applications that have been explored in the last years with the Euroflow strategy, but so many other different assays and functional assays in particular. Of course, we shall have a small uh, presentation on practical cases analysis and the final concluding remarks. What I bring you today is also part of a 10-year-old story that we have started back in 2010 in the primary immunodeficiency laboratory at Nova Medical School in Lisbon, Portugal. Our diagnostic and research laboratory that addresses not only PIDs but also other immune-related diseases works in close collaboration with several hospitals but particularly cooperates with the pediatric hospital of Dona Stefania. Through these 10 years, our collaboration has allowed the analysis of more than 3,000 samples and has contributed to the diagnostic of more than 250 PID patients with many different entities. Of course, this led to several publications in this field, including the description of new primary immunodeficiencies that we have explored together with colleagues from national and international PID centers. About a century ago, we find the first reports of diseases that are now recognized as primary immunodeficiencies. That is the case of ataxia telangiectasia, which is first reported in 1926. However, 1952 is in fact a very important date for a primary immunodeficiency identification. Dr. Bruton described at this moment the case of a young boy with recurrent episodes of pneumococcal sepsis who had also an absent gamma globulin peak in serum elytrophoresis. Later, this would be related to a defect in a tyrosine kinase that is essential for B cell development and that got her name after Dr. Bruton's. And then this was the first X linked gamma globulinemia case reported. Under Dr. Bruton's orientation, this boy was administered with gamma globulins, which kept him out of the sepsis episodes for a long time. Other therapeutic approaches have been developed afterwards, and as we now know that these are diseases related with genetic defects, in many of them, bone marrow transplant is a recommended procedure, such as uh, the one that happens for the first time in 1968 for a patient with a severe combined immunodeficiency. 
The story of David, the bubble boy, a skid patient that lived his life in his isolated, sterilized bubble for 12 years, also brought PID to world attention. Uh, and uh, the latest classification has now uh, been performed in 2020 by the International Union of Immunological Societies and includes 406 distinct disorders with 430 different uh, gene defects associated. Well, regarding overall prevalence, traditional estimates go from 1 per 10,000 or 1 per 5,000 individuals, if we exclude the asymptomatic patients with selective IgA deficiency. And these numbers allow us to classify PIDs as a rare diseases, both individually and collectively, taking into consideration, for instance, the EU criteria. However, the development of national registries that is ongoing and even the discovery and characterization of new inborn errors of immunity and the associated conditions suggest that these numbers shall be further revised. We possibly may consider uh, bringing the collective estimates to 1 per 5,000 or even up to 1 per 1,000 live births uh, for uh, PID patients. And supporting the relevance, the clinical and the epidemiological relevance of PIDs, we can see also now that from December 10, 2018, all newborns are being screened for SCID in the US. And similar efforts are really ongoing in European countries for SCID and eventually for other uh, primary immunodeficiencies as well. Well, in terms of the definition, we can now say that Primary immunodeficiencies are a group of inherited disorders, an heterogeneous group, with uh, defects, of course, in one or more components of the immune system, which leads also to a wide spectrum of clinical manifestations, the majority of cases with increased susceptibility to infections or a predisposition to autoimmune diseases that we see uh, more and more, and also malignancy, with also characteristic laboratory findings. The onset, of course, is in early childhood, but we see many other conditions that can have their onset in adolescence or even during adulthood. Regarding the classification of PIDs, traditionally we have considered eight big groups with combined immunodeficiencies that may or may not be uh, associated uh, with syndromic or characteristic features, also predominantly antibody deficiencies, the diseases of immune dysregulation, the defects in phagocytes and in innate immunity, along with autoinflammatory disorders and also complement deficiencies. Back in 2014, we had the addition of the phenocopies of PIDs and, at the moment, the latest classification from 2019, published just last year, classifies 10 groups in human inborn errors of immunity that add to the previous nine a new one that is related to bone marrow failures. Looking at immunodeficiency in general, flow cytometry is usually considered in the diagnostic uh, of secondary deficiencies. In fact, we all recognize that HIV infection has significantly contributed to the development of flow cytometry technologies, but flow is also an important tool for monitoring these patients. As we will see today, in PID, which are diseases related to the transmission of disease-carrying genes from parents to children or that result even from the novel mutations, flow cytometry will be highly helpful as it allows the identification of alterations in the immune cell subsets or protein expression and even allows us to identify alterations or assessing several different immune functions. In fact, full cytometry will be used in several steps of this diagnostic approach that has been proposed by the Jeffrey Model Foundation. In this stratified pathway that starts with the patient examination and with routine assays that eventually will allow us to identify from the beginning characteristic features or even to exclude other causes of immunodeficiency. And we furthermore will see in step two, a high uh, characterization of antibody responses, considering also the importance or the prevalence of these defects in terms of the whole primary immunodeficiency group.
It is in step 3 that we start to see more differentiated flow assays, starting of course with lymphocyte subsets and with other functional approaches to both lymphocytes and neutrophils, as you can see here with the oxidative burst evaluation. The final step is now a, a group of different assays, many of those that use flow cytometry and that should be addressed and oriented according to the suspected diagnosis. This means that they are mostly implemented in more specialized labs that are uh, specialized for these uh, purposes that include as well uh, laboratories responsible for the genetic evaluation of these patients. Let's start with the first group of immunodeficiencies that affect both cellular and humoral immunity. The most severe cases, SCITs, which are severe combined immunodeficiencies, have at least a defect on T cells. So from a lymphocyte subset analysis, you can see these different manifestations with a present or absent B and NK cells that orient us to identify, let's say, a RAG defect, a recombinase defect that is implied in the maturation of T and B cells and for which we won't see T, uh, neither B cells in these patients, but NKs will, be st will still be present. And on the other hand, if you have one of the most common defects, the gamma chain defect, you will see that it affects only T and NK cells, but these patients do present B cells in circulation. So, uh, a, f a routine lymphocyte subset analysis allows us to identify these uh, defects. It doesn't matter how many colors you, you use, but as many the better, you know that you will be able to identify the absence of some of these populations. Of course, the evaluation must be guided by age-matched reference ranges, which are very important, particularly for pediatric samples. And we shall start, in fact, with a pediatric patient, a baby boy, a five-month-old, that was sent to study for in our laboratory. And if you compare the image of this uh, first tube with CD3, CD4, and CD8 uh, from the patient compared to the control image, you will see that there's a real uh, absence of T cells in this baby. You see a residual population, probably of CD4 T cells, that are really, really low. In the second tube of this panel, that allows us to identify T, N, K, and B cells, we see that besides the residual lymphocyte population, we also see low numbers of N, K cells, and that the lymphocyte gate is in fact mostly composed of B cells. So this could be a skit with a T minus, N, K minus, B plus phenotype that was further confirmed as a gamma chain defect. What I can tell you about SCID, this severe combined immunodeficiency, is that the typical age of onset is around 2 to 6 months in babies with low weight or failure to thrive and that show persistent diarrhea or may show as well recurrent complicated infections and even graft versus host disease signs either from maternal cells or from residual leukocytes that could come in transfusions. Regarding laboratory findings, we know now that alterations in lymphocyte subsets and lymphopenia are typical of these patients that may also present with thrombocytosis, eosinophilia, and again, decreased immunoglobulins or absent even that we can also identify as a, a, a finding of these patients. Patient two was also sent to our lab with a suspected skid diagnosis. When you look at the lymphocyte subsets, this is not that typical of a skid because indeed there are T cells and also they are distributed in both CD4 and CD8 T cells. You even see in tube number two of the panel NKs and B cells, but in this case B cells are uh, relatively low in terms of the normal reference range. So could this be a skid? What I believe we all agree at the moment is that we need further information to assess how the T-cell compartment is composed in this patient. So let's go back to classical basic immunology that shows that naive and memory T-cell subsets can be identified by the differential expression of the isoforms CD45RA and CD45RO. 
Of course, we know now that several other markers are needed to further characterize circulating T cells, as we know so many different subsets can be recognized. If you take a look at these three dot plots that present the simple RA-RO distribution, you see, nevertheless, that in these three different ages, we are expecting some important differences. At the age of five months, the T cell compartment should be mostly composed of naive cells with this RA expression phenotype. As time goes by, memory subsets become more and more present in both children and adults. As for our patient, though we had circulating T cells, we see now that these are all memory cells, well, probably from a maternal origin, uh, maternal cells that have crossed the placenta during gestation, which leads us uh, to the conclusion that it can indeed be compatible with a skid. One of the latest goals of the Euroflow Consortium has been exactly to address uh, in a complete way the, the, the diagnostic of primary immunodeficiency, but also to orient it and to guide it according to the type of defects that are being identified in these patients. Most of you probably have heard about the primary immunodeficiency orientation tube the pi dot that has a conjugation of an eight color panel with 12 different markers that will be able to identify the main populations we would need for uh, an initial approach for primary immunodeficiency diagnostics. This means that we have a very strong validated panel with a database with reference images, automated and reproducible analysis, and also something that is very useful for, for us, an age-matched reference range from cord blood and peripheral blood. The bulk lysis protocol we use with it is also very important as it increases sensitivity, which is particularly important for uh, lymphopenic samples. So starting with the T-cell approach of the pi dot, we will see that we are able to identify using uh, CD27 and CD45 RA for uh, different subsets along within CD40 cells from naive, central memory, effector memory and effector terminally differentiated cells and a similar approach for CD80 cells that goes now with five subsets from naive, central, transitional memory to effector memory and then the two uh, terminally differentiated uh, subsets with CD27 and without the expression of this marker. So we have a complete approach using this combined strategy, isolating T cells uh, with the CD3 marker, which is alone, and then conjugating all of these markers to identify CD4, CD8s, and also gamma delta T cells. For B cells, we will have a similar approach, in this case, using now the CD3 negative cells that have CD19 in this combination with the gamma delta TCR. So, when isolating only CD19 positive cells, we can divide B cells in pregerminal center according to the expression of, again, CD27, now combined with um, a surface uh, expression of IgD and IgM, and then see how post-germinal center cells, both unswitched and switched, will be characterized in this uh, profile. Additionally, of course, we can have another set of subsets with our NK cells, very important also for this approach, but again with eosinophils, neutrophils, monocytes, also with CD16 positive monocytes, and other smaller subsets that we can characterize, identify and characterize in PID patients. Similarly to what happens with other Aeroflow platforms and tubes, using the InfiniSight software for analysis, it also allows us to have a final report. Uh, this final report addresses cell concentration and also the frequency of each population compared to total leukocytes. It's also important to notice that the report is editable, which means that we can add information such as other comments or even the dot plots, but we can also add it to add the frequency of the subsets compared to their mother population. Let's say 
the percentage of naive T cells within CD4 T cells. And this is important because we often have these values as diagnostic criteria for many PIDs. Later, we will have the possibility to see real-time analysis of a few files, but now I would like to address some of the potentialities and the information we can get from the PyDot tube. In this baby girl with 13 months, we have uh, uh, performed exactly this protocol, and what we will see after the first analysis is this combination of graphs. 800,000 events were acquired for this sample, and in fact, we can see now that this is a lymphopenic sample, only 270 cells per microliter as a lymphocyte count. We also see that despite B cells are also altered with very low numbers, we can see that there's a profound T cell defect with, with both low levels of CD4 T cells and CD8 T cells and particularly low levels of the naive subsets in each. We also see NK cells decreased and we could expect to see here a phenotype of a T minus B minus NK minus skid. Nonetheless, the girl already has 13 months, which would be a bit late for the diagnosis. But again, we also see that besides the lymphopenia, we also see that a total leukopenia is present in the sample. We have low neutrophils, low monocytes. So this could be something uh, different from what we were expecting at the first moment. In order to complete our characterization of the patient, we also address TMIC uh, activity and in this case through the assessment by flow cytometry of recent TMIC emigrants, which are T cells that still have the expression of CD31. These cells also correlate with another marker of TMIC activity, the TREKs, which are T cell receptor excision circles. At the age of 13 months, the patient had only 1% of recent TMIC emigrants that were present in a much higher percentage at birth, as we had access from the cord blood bank to cord blood cells in which the percentages of RTEs were in fact increased. So somehow we can say this patient has an acquired TMIC dysfunction that is also uh, conjugated with a bone marrow aplasia. The patient was also tested for uh, the, the skid panel, for the PID panel of genes, and was so negative to the, the, the requested genes. When we have a normal TMIC function, the T-cell repertoire is a diverse one. So to assess it, we have another important assay that we use in this scenario. We use a combination of 24 V-beta families from the TCR and we characterize them to assess re the repertoire diversity. In terms of the protocol, 24 V-beta families are conjugated in eight tubes, each one with one family marked in FITC, another in PE, and a third one in both fluorescences that allow us to use uh, the, the assessment of three different families per tube, optimizing the amount of sample needed in these cases. We expect to see in a healthy control a diversity in the distribution of the different families, but again, our patient with the, the TMIC dysfunction shows an altered repertoire with a smaller diversity. Few families are more represented compared to the expected range you see here in blue, and most families are, on the contrary, much less represented than expected, as you can see in this slide. These oligoclonal repertoires are also typical of one condition called the Omen syndrome that is due to hypomorphic mutations in the recombinases, for instance. And in this scenario, we would have a very uh, activated repertoire because many of these cells are in fact autoreactive. So the expression of HLI HLADR, a marker of activation of the T cell, can also be helpful in the assessment of Omen syndrome patients. Other informations are also possible from the analysis of the PIDOT tube. If you see now, we have a new patient, a 14 year old boy, and the analysis of the, of the populations allow us to identify here also a lymphopenic patient with alterations in both the T and the B cell compartment. But 
we can also highlight that this patient has an increase in the presence of gamma delta T cells, which are in this case negative for CD4 or negative or present a dim expression of CD8. Despite this is a nonspecific observation, the increased presence of gamma delta T cells may be an important finding when we are suspecting DNA repair defects. One of these, ataxia telangiectasia, is in fact a defect that results from a mutation in the ATM gene, which brings out a neurodegenerative disorder that comes evident in infancy and early childhood, related also to immune alterations and impaired immune function. We know that T cells are dependent on DNA uh, repair mechanisms, and particularly alpha-beta T cells, for which probably we have this accumulation of gamma deltas. Our patient was in fact first sent to our laboratory at the age of six, and he was assessed along with his younger brother at the moment with few uh, clinical manifestations, but both had already the presence of this increased gamma delta population. So there is more information you can get from the PIDA tube, including for these patients. We now look at another 13-year-old uh, boy that we uh, analyzed using the PIDOT. This time, besides a few alterations we see in uh, particularly B cells, we also have an increased presence of another subset of double negatives, or uh, double negatives with dim expression of CD8, but this time they were not gamma deltas. In fact, we see now an increased presence of alpha-beta double negative T cells that we know are typical and of the uh, autoimmune lymphoproliferative syndrome, ALPS. ALPS is a disease of immune dysregulation, group 4, that is associated to splenomegaly, lymphadenopathies, and also autoimmune cytopenias affecting at least two lineages. History of lymphoma is also frequent, along with uh, the possibility of having other family members affected. Curiously, we have an important criteria from the laboratory findings. This is the presence of an increased population of TCR alpha beta double negative T cells. These cells that don't express either CD4 or neither CD8 should be above 6% of total T cells. If you see now, other biomarkers have been identified as minor criteria that have be, should be conjugated uh, with the, at least two of them present, and these include fast ligand levels, or IL-10, or vitamin B12 increased, along with this impaired fast-mediated apoptosis that in fact results in this accumulation of TCR alpha-beta cells. So, this is also an important finding that we can have directly from the assessment of the pilot tube. I would like to address now the results of a female uh, patient that has been also processed in this setting. At this point, we can also highlight the lymphopenia, the alterations on the T-cell compartment, but let's look at the B-cells, because indeed we find here that there is a, a severe uh, uh, alteration in the post-germinal compartment. So post-germinal cells are memory B-cells that have or have not gone through the switch process, but are in fact highly decreased in this patient. Along with this, we know that she had also an hypogamma globulinemia, a history of bronchiectasy, splenomegaly, recurrent inf respiratory infections, and low vaccine responses, and we know now that this could have uh, what we, it takes to make a cr criteria for a common variable immunodeficiency. Well, common variable immunodeficiency is in fact a category that includes a very heterogeneous group of diseases, and we know now that they are associated with these uh, manifestations. More than one typical clinical manifestation, and we include here infection, autoimmunity, or lymphoproliferation, associated to hypogamma with low IgM or low IG IgA or both. Of course, impairment of vaccine responses, the exclusion of other possible causes of immune deficiency, and despite they could be informative, genetic studies are not generally required, as we know that monogenic causes are only present in about up to 10% of all these patients. So what I can tell you is that 
there is a genetic background, a very complex one, uh, in, in the common variable immunodeficiency group. It is evident that we need to better address the identification and the classification of CVIDs and other predominantly antibody deficiencies as well, even to better comprehend the underlying mechanisms of each entity. And previous classifications already used flow cytometry uh, as the, the, the one used by Euroclass that based the classification of these defects on the B-cell immunophenotyping. I am also very confident that the Euroflow strategy and this algorithm will also be very helpful for the identification and characterization of the B-cell deficiencies. So Euroflow has a put together a, a combination of tubes that explore the B-cell compartment for both pre- and post-germinal central subsets and also characterizing the isotype expression of each population. The aim will be to obtain distinct patterns that can be then associated to uh, different entities such as CVID or a gamma globulinemia that will have some different types of defects as you see here. The almost absence of B cells in a gamma globulinemia and the differential absence in CVIDs. I would just like to add that the description of these B-cell patterns that are different can be also associated with different clinical profiles. And this can in fact improve not only diagnostics and classification, but also the patient monitoring. As you know that uh, when they are under uh, immunoglobulin therapy, immunoglobulins can be altered, but not the lymphocyte subsets. I would like to address now the assessment of the lymphocyte function. And considering, for instance, T cells, we know now that they respond to specific antigen stimulation through the presentation of the antigen by antigen presenting cells in their HLA molecules, but also there are mitogens, which are substances able to stimulate in an unspecific way the T cell. And afterwards, we can assess frequency and phenotype alterations on the cells, their proliferation, and other functions such as cytokine secretion or cytotoxicity. Let's start with proliferation. Classic radioactive assays were, and I think they are still used, to assess lymphocyte responses. In brief, stimulated cells would integrate tritiated thymidine, a nucleotide analog, as they proliferate, and for which culture cells' radioactivity would be proportional to their proliferation index. Similar approaches were developed for cytometry with BRDU and other analogs or ki 67 and also proliferation dyes have been used for this purpose. Dyes like CFSA, that are usually divided at each cell division, allow us to track the number of divisions upon stimulation, thus helping us to assess the proliferative responses to different stimuli. For a while now, we are using an alternative approach to assess lymphocyte responses. The expression of CD134, OX40, proved to have a good correlation with other proliferation assays, with the advantage of being a faster test, and considering both the preparation protocol, but also the incubation periods, particularly for antigen assessment, as we know that classical tests usually take up to 7-day cultures. In fact, in this protocol, cells are stimulated with the necessary antigens and mitogens for 46 to 48 hours, and then they are characterized by flow cytometry for the expression of CD134 and CD25. If you look at the patient with the CVID that we just discussed a few slides ago, you can see that we were able to assess this impaired response of T cells in, to both phytohemagglutinin, which is a mitogen, but also to the PPD antigen after a 48-hour stimulation period. Other functional assays can be helpful for the diagnosis of different primary immunodeficiencies. Looking at X-linked hyper-IgM within the combined immunodeficiencies, we understand that these patients have a failure in the T-cell B-cell communication that interferes with the normal class switch process. Opportunistic infections and biliary tract and liver diseases are recognized in these patients, and also neutropenia 
and a very particular uh, uh, immunoglobulin uh, pattern that shows increased IgM with other isotopes, particularly low or even absent. To assess this defect, which is the X-linked form, is related to the CD40 ligand deficiency, we can stimulate CD40 cells for 5 to 4 hours and observe whether or not the CD40 cells start expressing CD40 ligand after stimulation. Being an X-linked uh, form, we know that women could be also carriers and this assay is also able to identify carrier uh, patients. Within syndromic immunodeficiencies, we can also consider hyper-IgE syndromes, for which the autosomic dominant form is related to a mutation in STAT3. This mutation impairs the Th17 and follicular T cells pathways and will also present with characteristic laboratory findings besides the other distinctive features of these patients, such as the broad nasal bridge. So using a, an assay similar to the one used in the CD40 ligand deficiency, we should have in this case brufaldin or monensin, which are molecules that block the secretion of the cytokines, and then go and assess the intracellular expression of IL-17 or IL-21 to address respectively Th17 and follicular T cells. I would like to call your attention for the necessity to have also for functional assays age-matched reference ranges. As you can see, the levels of the cytokines can vary with age. Within the diseases of immune dysregulation, the hemophagocytic syndromes also rely for their diagnosis in several flow cytometry assays. In fact, these hyperinflammatory syndromes that show increased susceptibility to viral infections relate to cytotoxic defects that can be addressed by different assays. Flow can then be helpful for the assessment of specific proteins expressed at the surface or inside the cells, such as perforin, SAP, or ZIAP, but also we can address and quantify the levels of different populations, and in this case, NKT cells are relevant as they are absent in some of these patients. Recent studies also suggest that the levels of activated T cells and particularly CD8 T cells, it's very helpful for patient monitoring when the disease is active. In fact, we have also monitored some patients uh, with uh, active HLH with these levels and they do correlate with other important biomarkers such as CD25. Functional assays that measure the levels of CD107A can also be used. This is a molecule that lies inside the granules of cytotoxic cells and goes to the cell surface upon degranulation. If you stimulate cells, either NK or CD8 T cells, we expect to see an increase in the levels of surface expression of CD107A, but this does not happen in some of the forms of the hemophagocytic syndromes. The final confirmation of an impaired cytotoxic capacity can also be measured by flow cytometry using cultures of K562 cells with our patient cells. So with different effector to target cells, we can assess the levels of death in the targets and then can prove or not the abnormal cytotoxic capacity in our patients. Phagocytes can also be assessed by flow cytometry as we understand that their number and function, or even both, can be affected. Besides the characterization of adhesion molecules, we have available adhesion and chemotaxis assays, and as well, the evaluation of phagocytosis. But please look at the oxidative burst assay that is mandatory in the assessment of a possible CGD, chronic granulomatose disease. Oxidative burst occurs due to the activation of a particular enzyme, NADPH oxidase, which is composed by several units, some of which are coded in the chromosome X and others in other chromosomes. This means that, according to the mutation, we may have X-link forms of CGD, the more frequent, but also autosomic forms that may be present in both males and females. For the flow cytometry assay, neutrophils are stimulated with PMA in the presence of a substance, dihydrorhodamine, that can be oxidated to rhodamine, which is in turn fullercent. 
in healthy patients, the fluorescence of stimulated cells increases significantly compared to the non-stimulated cells, achieving a normal oxidative index above 30. Of course, neither the X-linked forms nor neither the autosomic forms of CGD achieve these levels of normal oxidative index. As you can see in the sample of this one-year-old boy that we assayed, this is a test performed with three tubes. In the first one, no DHR, neither PMA are included. The second has only DHR. And the third one is the one that gets the stimulation with PMA. No alterations, however, are observable in the fluorescence levels of both the stimulated and unstimulated tube, which is typical of the X-linked form of CGD. In this case, the disease was transmitted by the mother that presents the bimodal pattern typical of carriers. In fact, it is similar to the one observed in the grandmother that has also a carrier pattern, but in this case with a differential X chromosome lionization. Finally, to address defects in innate immunity, we can also assess how the toll-like receptor pathways are affected or not. For that purpose, different uh, specific uh, stimulations can be used, such as LPS for the toll-like receptor 4 or flagellin for TLR5, and in this case, what we see is an activation of the neutrophil that occurs upon a stimulation. We know that normally cells will lose the expression of CD62L, and this does not occur in patients with defects in these pathways, such as mutations with IREC4 or MID88. Finally, we can also see that even in complement deficiencies that are typically addressed with other type of assays, we can also add an input from flow cytometry addressing the expression of surface molecules such as CD46, a membrane cofactor, but also CD59 and CD55 we use in uh, PNH, but also that can be present in other particular deficiencies such as Chapel disease. In brief, I will conclude by saying that the laboratory investigations of PIDs should be oriented according to the type of defect that we are suspecting and the concomitant clinical findings as well, and that the assays should be sequential, from routine testing like full blood counts or lymphocyte subsets to more specialized assays and immunological approaches like proliferation or cytotoxicity that will be, of course, combined finally with the possible identification of the genetic defect. And I would like to show you now real-time analysis of a few cases. I will show you now the analysis process of one patient. When we select the file, the first thing we have to do is to exclude two parameters before processing the file in the database. So in the export mode, I will remove the site scatter height and the time for this final file to be assessed. And then I will open the file without these two parameters. It's time now to look at the databases available from the Euro Infinisite Euroflow database system. And for our particular case, we shall use the Euroflow PID database for peripheral blood. And we should introduce the age of the patient, in this case, four years and 10 months, and then select. You will see that the panel is already mentioned here and you just have to say OK for the database to start. Usually this check on the fluorochromes and monoclonal antibodies used will be uh, presented and you just have to say OK and the database starts analyzing. Once the database analysis is finished, the software may give us some messages, such as the check percentage alert that we have see here, stating that the software 
was not able to characterize a percentage of cells higher than expected, as this will require our attention later on. We shall say, okay. But it also asks us to, at this point, input the absolute counts for this sample that we may obtain from the full blood count leukocytes or from a single platform strategy using flow cytometry. In this case, we have a total count of 6,214 cells that we introduce at this moment. Our job now is to analyze the events the automated analysis wasn't able to. And this can be performed by opening this check population item where all the populations that were not properly classified are. I recall you that this is something like 4.2%. And if the protocol has been well performed and the sample quality is good, both the check populations and afterwards the debris doublets will be uh, with low values. This means like up to 5% in checks and let's say 20 to 25% in debris. So you could start analyzing the different subsets you have either from the top of the or the bottom, but just to let you know how we could perform this, we would be clicking in this interrogation and see what the database analysis wasn't able to compare to the population, the database thinks that it's more close to this one. In this case, we do think that um, this is proper uh, analysis in terms of the evaluation for the pregerminal centers that they have in fact a lower expression of IgD, but this could happen and so we can consider these cells within this subset. We will see that they are probably migrating to another uh, population and the same for uh, unswitched memory uh, uh, plasma cells here that you can see that both uh, uh, points for the, the characterized and the check population are close. So we can also agree that this could be this, uh, this suggested subset and so on for the other more. And continuing with the CD40 cells, now we see that we have here possible debris. And now, yes, we agree that this could be naive CD40 cells. The same for this transitional central memory and also for effector memory. And again, for CD8. And this would continue for as long as we have checks to assure. And for CD8s, I would like to stress out that it is very important to check properly uh, the definition of naive and also of central memory T cells because they get sometimes a bit confused. So address this in with particular attention. And we could continue this to all the other cell subsets again at this point. In here, the same situation with naive B cells being characterized here. These are not effector, and we can then call the population that we believe that uh, is more compatible with this one. And here you see that these are in fact naive CD80 cells and not uh, terminally differentiated cells. So we can continue. And the same will occur for the other populations that we are going to address as well, identifying eventual debris and doublets as well, and classifying them according to what is more alike. For uh, neutrophils, eosinophils, monocytes, and other subsets until all the checks are cleared and clarified. And when this happens, for both debris and doublets, we know now that the check item disappears and we have all the populations classified, also including the alert messages that we see, let's say with nucleated cells, we have 16 items that have either the values altered in concentration or frequency. Of course, we can check each population by itself and look at B cells in particular and their uh, reference images in the automated separation also for T cells and I always look at CD4 T cells separately and then also for 
oh, sorry, for CD8 T cells and address them in terms of what are their uh, reference images as well. And as we can see in this patient, there are mostly cells within the CD4 compartment in the naive and central memory subsets with low levels of, uh, of uh, effector memory. And the same happens here in, uh, in CD8s. But in the end, if we consider all the subsets, then we will have, according to the age matched reference ranges, this final report that can be edited by uh, ourselves to include, as you can see here, the different uh, graphs or dot plots that we will wish, but also the different comments that allow us to identify which cells are altered, which populations are increased or decreased in this particular setting. This was, in fact, the, the, the sample from one of our skid patients that was assessed in the PROS transplant monitoring. And we see now that despite he still has a few alterations, we know or recognize that the patient presents with naive T cells and both CD4 and CD8s, and also with uh, uh, B cells in this context. We are now looking at another sample from an older patient that has gone through database analysis. Again, we see that are still 3.5% of events that were not automatically classified. Thus, we need to check these populations. When all the check events are classified, we see that the check folder disappears. And we must take a look now at our, both the uh, images, but also to the alerts that we see here. And in fact, the absent population alert is really high with nine points here with the absence of the B cells that we also see in the reference images. The patient we are looking at that also shows already some level of impairment on the T cell compartment with low naive CD4 and TCD8 cells is in fact an XLA patient with an X link a gamma globulinemia showing no circulating B cells. So, to finish this presentation, I would like to highlight as take a message that flow cytometry is indeed a crucial tool for the diagnostic workup and monitoring of PIDs. Immunophenotyping and functional assays are both helpful in guiding doctors in several PIDs, and initial routine approaches can be complemented with extra assays in specialized labs. Also, though not all PID patients present major changes in flow cytometry evaluation or the presence of a protein may not assure its functionality, flow cytometry may help direct diagnostics and genetic studies, despite it is not always possible to establish the underlying genetic basis of a PID. Finally, standardized analysis strategies are needed, as in so many other fields of immunology. Particularly for primary immunodeficiencies, if we consider the rarity of these entities and their diverse presentations, and also it is crucial to address the reference ranges and in an age-matched form. And I would like to end thanking you all for your interest and your attention in this presentation. Obrigada, as we say in Portugal. I would like to also acknowledge the work and all the effort of the team working with me at Nova Medical School and at Hospital Dona Estefania, always aiming to improve patient care in our center. And thank also to people that have been so important in my training through the years. Maria Rose at Hospital São Francisco Xavier in Lisbon and from Chicago, now in LA, Maurice O'Gorman in Paris, Capucine Picard in Stockholm, Ian and Bryson, and also uh, Rebecca Marsh and Sam Jayang that have been always available to help in many situations. Last but not least, I have to thank Cytognos and particularly Karina and Anna, always there to help and to give so helpful advice. And I am now keen to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you.